Before the Fellowship was the greatest story you've never heard. I'm Cameron. And I'm Dan, unmuting my microphone. I'm Greg. Join us as we read and react to The Silmarillion by J.R.R. Tolkien. Last time we were introduced to two important figures, Elwe Singolo, a lord of the Teleri, one of the elf, elven groups, now known as Elu Thingol, and Malian, the Maya. On his journey westward to Valinor, Thingol was enchanted by Melian's beauty, and the two established a kingdom in the hidden halls of Menagroth. Today we continue with Quenta Silmarillion, and we're on page 57 of the second edition. In time, the hosts of the Vanyar and the Noldor came to the last western shores of the Hitherlands. In the north, these shores, in the ancient days after the Battle of the Powers, bent ever westward. Until in the northernmost parts of Arda, only a narrow sea divided Amman, upon which Valinor was built from the Hitherlands. But this narrow sea was filled with grinding ice because of the violence of the frosts of Melkor. Therefore, Arome did not lead the hosts of the Eldali into the far north, but brought them to the fair lands about the river Sirion that afterwards were named Beleriand. And from those shores, whence first the Eldar looked in fear and wonder on the sea, there stretched an ocean, wide and dark and deep, between them and the mountains of Amman. Now Ulmo, by the council of the Valar, came to the shores of Middle-earth and spoke with the Eldar who waited there, gazing on the dark waves. And because of his words and the music which he made for them on his horns of shell, their fear of the sea was turned rather to desire. Therefore, Ulmo uprooted an island which long had stood alone amid the sea, far from either shore, since the tumults of the fall of Eluin. And with the aid of his servants, he moved it, as it were a mighty ship, and anchored it in the Bay of Balar, into which Sirion poured its, his, his water. Then the Vanyar and the Noldor embarked upon that isle and were drawn over the sea and came at last to the long shores beneath the mountains of Amman. And they entered Valinor and were welcomed to its bliss. But the eastern horn of the island, which was deep grounded in the shoals off the mouths of Sirion, was broken asunder and remained behind. And that, it is said, was the Isle of Balar, to which afterwards Ose often came. But the Teleri remained still in Middle-earth, for they dwelt in the East Balerian far from the sea, and they heard not the summons of Ulmo until too late. And many searched still for Elwe, their lord, and without him they were unwilling to depart. But when they learned that Ingwe and Finwe and their peoples were gone. Then many of the Teleri pressed on to the shores of Beleriand and dwelt thereafter near the mouths of Sirion in longing for their friends that had departed. And they, turk and they took Olwe, Elwe's brother, to be their king. Long they remained by the coasts of the Western Sea, and Ose and Winnen came to them and befriended them, and Ose instructed them sitting upon a rock near to the margin of the land, and of him they learned all manner of sea lore and sea music. Thus it came to be that the Teleri, who were from the beginning lovers of water and the fairest singers of all the elves, were after enamored of the seas, and their songs were filled with the sound of waves upon the shore. When many years had passed, Ulmo hearkened to the prayers of the Noldor and of Finwë, their king, who grieved at their long sundering from the Teleri, and besought him to bring them to Amman if they would come. And most of them proved now willing indeed. But great was the grief of Ose when Ulmo returned to the coasts of Beleriand 
to bear them away to Valinor. For his care was for the seas of Middle-earth and the shores of the hitherlands, and he was ill-pleased that the voices of the Teleri should be heard no more in his domain. Some he persuaded to remain, and those were the Falathrim, the elves of the Phalas, who in after days had dwellings at the havens of Brithrombar and Eglarest, the first mariners in Middle-earth and the first makers of ships. Círdan the shipwright was their lord. The kinsfolk and the friends of Elwë Singolo also remained in the hitherlands, seeking him yet, though they would fain have departed to Valinor and the light of the trees. If Ulmo and Olwë had been willing to tarry longer, but Olwë would be gone, and at last the main host of the Teleri embarked upon the isle, and Ulmo drew them far away. Then the friends of Elwë were left behind, and they called themselves Eglath, the Forsaken People. They dwelt in the woods and hills of Beleriand, rather than by the sea, which filled them with sorrow. But the desire of Amon was ever in their hearts. But when Elwë awoke from his long trance, he came forth from Nan Elmoth with Malian, and they dwelt thereafter in the woods in the midst of the land. Greatly, though, he had desired to see again the light of the trees in the face of Malian, he beheld the light of Amon as in an unclouded mirror, and in that light he was content. His people gathered around him in joy, and they were amazed. For fair and noble as he had been, now he appeared as it were, a lord of the Maiar, his hair as gray silver, tallest of all the children of Iluvatar, and a high doom was before him. Now Ose followed after the host of Olwe, and when they were come to the Bay of Eldamar, which is Elven home, he called to them, and they knew his voice and begged Ulmo to stay their voyage. And Ulmo granted their request, and at his bidding, Ose made fast the island and rooted it to the foundations of the sea. Ulmo did this the more readily, for he understood the hearts of the Teleri, and in the council of the Valar he had spoken against the summons, thinking that it were better for the Quendi to remain in Middle-earth. The Valar were little pleased to learn what he had done. And Finwë grieved when the Teleri came not, and yet more when he learned that Elwë was forsaken, and knew that he should not see him again unless it were in the halls of Mandos. But the island was not moved again, and stood there alone in the Bay of Eldamar, and it was called Tal Arasea, the Lonely Isle. There the Teleri abode as they wished under the stars of heaven, and yet within sight of Amon and the deathless shore, and by that long sojourn apart from the lonely isle, was caused the sundering of their speech from that of, of the Vanyar and the Noldor. To these the Valar had given a land and a dwelling place. Even among the radiant flowers of the tree-lit gardens of Valinor, they longed still at times to see the stars. And therefore a gap was made in the great walls of the Pylori, and there in a deep valley that ran down to the sea, the Eldar raised a high green hill. Tuna, it was called. From the west, the light of the trees fell upon it, and its shadow lay ever eastward, and to the east it looked towards the Bay of Elvenholm and the Lonely Isle and the shadowy seas. Then through the Kalachira, the pass of light, the radiance of the blessed realm streamed forth, kindling the dark waves to silver and gold, and it touched the lonely isle, and its western shore grew green and fair. There bloomed the first flowers that ever were east of the mountains of Amman. 
Upon the crown of Tuna, the city of the elves was built, the white walls and the terraces of Tyrion. And the highest towers of that city was the tower of Ingwe, Mindon Eldelieva, whose silver lamp shone far out into the mists of the sea. Few are the, are the ships of mortal men that have seen its slender beam. In Tyrion upon Tuna, the Vanyar and the Noldor dwelt long in fellowship. And since of all things in Valinor they loved most the white tree, Yovana made for them a tree like to a lesser image of Telperion, save that it did not give light of its own being. Galathilion was named in the Sindarin tongue. This tree was planted in the courts beneath Mindan, and there flourished, and its seedlings were many in Eldamar. Of these, one was afterwards planted in tall Arasea, and it prospered there, and was named Celeborn. Thence came in the fullness of time, as is elsewhere told, Nimloth, the white tree of Numenor. Manwe and Varda loved most the Vanyar, the fair, fair elves, but the Noldor were beloved of Aule, and he and his people came often among them. Great became their knowledge and their skill, yet even greater was their thirst for more knowledge, and in many things they soon surpassed their teachers. They were changeful in speech, for they had great love of words and sought ever to find names more fit for all things that they knew or imagined. And it came to pass that the masons of the house of Finway, quarrying in the hills after stone, for they delighted in the building of high towers, first discovered the earth gems and brought them forth in countless myriads. And they devised tools for the cutting and shaping of gems and carved them in many forms. They hoarded them not, but gave them freely, and by their labor enriched all Valinor. So in summary, Ulmo brought the Vanyar and the Noldor across the sea to Valinor on a floating island. In the absence of Elway or Thingol, Olway took leadership of, of the Teleri, and they dwelt in Beleriand. The Teleri became a great seafaring people. After many years, Ulmo returned to Beleriand to bring the Teleri to Amman. Many were willing and departed, called the Falathrim, but some, especially those faithful to Thingol, remained in Beleriand, the Eglath, the Forsaken. And Ulmo fastened the traveling island in the sea and is now the island, island of Tol Arasea. And we also heard more about the Vanyar, the Fair Elves, and the Noldor, who were beloved of Aule, and the Noldor will be probably the most important race uh, moving forward. Yep. Yeah, that was a lot. That was a long reading. There's a, a lot of names too, and I was trying to. I, I while while you're reading, I opened up that chart again of the Sundering of the Elves because that's really what we're hearing more of, right? We're hearing more about. The, the very, so remember originally it was those who were in the darkness and they split. So now there's further divisions, including a couple splits of the Teleri, those who decided to go to Amman and those who stayed that were mainly um, bound to Thingol. They, that's mainly why Teleri stayed in Middle Earth because they were uh, loyal to him and he was, he wasn't going to leave Melian. So they kind of stayed there. So, Again, there's there's some names here that most of which aren't that important to remember. So, you know, it gives these names for the two branches of the Teleri, which are Egloth, the Forsaken people who stayed behind in Middle Earth, and then what's the other one? The uh, Fala, something. <laughs> Fala the Falathrim. Falathrim that. Uh, decided to ride on a floating island across the sea. Which sounds really fun. Which also yeah. proves that, like, you know, islands in Tolkien's world are not like islands in our world. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you do that with an island in our world. 
<laughs> pretty cool. Maybe maybe it's good for people to know that Amon is it's Valinor, right? Amon is Valinor. It's the mountains, right? Yeah, I think that um, are that territory, or there's overlap there in what they because um, Valinor was separated from Middle Earth, so you have to travel by water, and so I think Val. Yeah, Valinor and Amon are basically the same place. So maybe branding wise, like when we discuss it, should we call it Valinor or should we call it Amon? So people don't get confused. I do think I kind of go back and forth, but Valinor is probably the most straightforward because it sounds like Valar. And it sounds right. like Valar, yeah. So yeah. so so to recap again, to recap the recap of the recap that Greg <laughs> gave. The Eldar Oh my gosh, this is, yeah, you just need this chart. Second edition, I'll put it up for the camera for our YouTube audience. Second edition of of uh, the Silmarillion. So you have the Quendi, the, who are the elves, and then there's two groups. The Eldar, who are called on this great journey. The Avari are the ones who stay behind. They refuse it. But then the Eldar, not all of them make it there. The Vanyar went to Valinor. The Noldor went to Valinor. Some of the Teleri went to Valinor, but some stayed behind. And then of those we have, so then some of those Teleri, Greg, is this is this the case that some of the Teleri that were left behind have now been brought as well? There's like a second journey? Yeah, so I, I think, I'm reading here from the text, but it says, so the, the Vanyar and the Noldor go, right? But the Teleri stay behind. And, and then it says, When many years had passed, Ulmo hearkened to the prayers of the Noldor and of Finway their king, who grieved at their long sundering from the Teleri and besought him to bring them to Amon. So then Ulmo goes back to bring the Teleri. Yeah, he goes back, but not all the Teleri come. So that's why right. just right. some of the Teleri make it there. Right. Exactly. And then, although, the ones, you know, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say one of the questions we had earlier, something we were thinking about was um, did more of the elves go to Valinor or like how do you split up that? But I think it said that that was the great host, the ones that did go to Valinor, the Teleri, that was like the greatest of their host. Um, so most of the Teleri did go, but there were those who were. Uh, unwilling to leave Elway Thingol. And I think um, <laughs> this is kind of a tragic thing. I, I, I think it's fascinating, but Thingol um, Elway, I'm going to call him Thingol because I think for the yeah. most part, that's what he's called after this. But yeah. Thingol, he was in this trance, right? He was enchanted by Melian's beauty and they they were under the stars staring at each other for years. As the, I can imagine it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. um, but when that finished, he's like, "Where'd all my people go?" Like I, <laughs> I thought we were going. <laughs> like he he his that was like a slight um, tangent for him, but he did want to go. Like because he had <laughs> he wasn't he didn't just like forsake his people. He just got distracted, you know. For like um, a year. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe many years. But, um, just under the stars, you know, in this loving trance. Um, but yeah, but he, he did. Then he like upgrades, though. He marries Malian and yeah, he like yeah. he looks different because he 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 like glows radiantly right. from his right, relationship. Right. With her. It's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. And but he, he does want to go. And I think. This is pretty interesting. Um, he's one of the few elves who originally were kind of the ambassadors, right? Elway, um, Finway, and... Um, Olway? Olway was one. And then there's one more who's the Vanyar um, leader. But they, they went to Valinar originally with Orome and saw the light of the, uh, the, the oh, two yeah. lights. Right. And so there was something about that experience that it was so immense that that's why they were eager to bring their fellow elves to Valinor. And so it mentions here that Thingol, he still wanted to return to the light. He had seen it one time and that was still his kind of deepest desire. And that was part of what drew him to Melian too, is that in her face, he could see the light of Valinor. Um, right. It says unclouded as, as in an unclouded mirror. 
and in that light he was content. And so there is something kind of tragic about that. Like he just kind of, um, he kind of missed the boat or the island, I guess, you know. Uh, He missed the island island that was going to take him, take him away over the sea. But he did want to go. And uh, I I think, um, I don't know, I think probably all of us have experienced things like this where uh, something that we really deeply desire just... uh, we miss the we miss the chance to do that thing. Or, it's a very simple. I I can't remember all the rest. Of, I know he probably isn't perfect. He probably does some bad things later too. But um, this this part I kind of sympathize with him. But it's not all bad because he's got he's I think he's fairly content with Melian and his people. Yeah, I think I think he's got it pretty good. I don't I don't feel bad for him at all. <laughs> <laughs> How do, we, say, how do the, we dis- distinguish um, Amon from Valinor? Because, I mean, it, do elves live in I think Amon, Amon but in not in Valinor? Is, or is Amon it just, is particularly the name of the mountains. Well, no, it's the, the name of the central region of Amon. So if you think of Amon like a <laughs> giant continent, and then the central region is Valinor. Do you have, a, do you have the map of uh, Amon? No. I don't. That'd be good to pull up. Um, so, so you're saying Amman is a larger area, and, a, and yeah, it's like a, is a specific, a specific section within that where they dwell. Yeah, like the middle of it. So it's kind of like in the in North America, the the middle part where is we dwell is called the United States of America. But there's also Canada, and there's also. Um, I thought further. Canada was North America and Mexico was South America. <laughs> 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 There's also other places, right? So it's like oh, it's not. Yeah. So yeah, it's, right. it's, it's like a giant continent, but there's like a there's a there's Valinor where where, but but what I'm trying to understand is, are there any elves that dwelt in Amman outside of Valinor? I think they all do. I think I think that's what like Tuna is and. Some of these other places that are mentioned. Okay, so they're not in Valinor, but they're in Amman. Okay, cool. So, so think, that's like the does that sound right, Cameron? Yeah, they live in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why we we're being Canada. so American centric. Like, <laughs> we could have. It probably would have been easier to use the UK as a, <laughs> an example. I know, but I just wanted to throw you guys under the bus. <laughs> um, so, okay. <laughs> Tuna. All right, so I just listened to a podcast of these guys reading the Silmarillion, but they're actually experts, so it's not oh, us. Wow. I just listened to like a few hours of that, um, and then I googled what, what's the difference between Amon and Valinor, and this guy yeah. says, <laughs> this guy on the internet says, Amon was the name of the continent that lied west of Middle Earth. Um. And Valinor is the name of the realm or the country. So you see, Amon is so, like the general name. So exactly what I just said. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was busy Googling. I didn't know. I wasn't listening to you. Well, thank you. Another interesting thing that I noticed was the talk about the Noldor and how, um, like, they're – they're becoming more unique or distinguished from the other elves. Mm. Um, Owlé is like giving his time to them. Owlé is like interested in crafting, building. Um, so he's like teaching them things. But then the Noldor learn really fast and they want more and more knowledge. And they have like changing speech because they love words. So we're also learning more about the Noldor. And pretty soon we're going to zoom in on particular characters within these um these elven races it's gonna be really exciting that's awesome How, do, were we introduced to the calaquendi in in this or not no the calaquendi okay. is just the name of those who um see the light right but the, so let me, let me hold up this shot this is why i'm asking because let's see if i can get it mostly centered um, you'll see that the Calaquendi are comprised of like three of the tribes that came from 
um, the Elder. So that's kind of cool. It's like a reuniting. It's it's not just. Well, uh, I don't think they're like actually. As un- they're not as united as that chart makes it seem. They. It's they are, they share this. Ca- they share this same quality, which is that they saw the light, but they're still pretty distinct. Yes, and, and that, there's that two will... overall groups. There's the Calaquendi who see the light, and the Moraquendi who never see the light okay. of the tree. Nice. So I think it's just like a a, a naming convention for that group. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah. At this point, I think uh, maybe it's worth mentioning the Noldor. So I, th- I think again the the Vanyar aren't really much part of the story because they're not they don't have a whole lot of conflict. I think we said that about Ingwe is that the leader or Finway? Which one is it? Gosh, now I need to really look at this. Here, chart. let me pull up my charts. <laughs> Who I don't want to say I don't want to say the wrong names. Finway is the Noldor king. Is that right? Uh, yep. Okay, yep. Ingwe then. I think it's Ingwe is the Ingwe. Um, Vanyar king. And and we said before that he's kind of boring cuz he just in He just stays in Amman. He doesn't Yeah, he just like That's kind of the and... He really loves, loves it great. and doesn't do anything. So the Vanyar aren't much part of the story. The Noldor are probably very important and the Teleri to some degree are important too. Yo, is it in Dees? I'm looking at a chart right now that lists a Oh no, that's a wife. That's the wife of Finway. Okay, never mind. Okay, there's there's so much here too. Kirdon is a name that's will be important to remember to some degree. He's one it's of the, the hard C, right? Kirdan. Hard, or I think so. Kirdan, yeah. The yeah. shipwright. Um, he's if you kind need of to remember important. it. I changed my name to it. Oh, I was thinking that actually when we were reading. Like, <laughs> changed it as we were reading. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he's he'll come back again. Um, All right. Well, uh, I'll I'll just say welcome to season two. So we uh, got some reviews and emails from you guys. So thanks for reaching out. We do read everything. Um, why don't you guys let us know through email or a review what what you think about this story? If if we're getting something wrong, if you have a different interpretation, let us know. Um, here's here's a review, five stars, by Happy in Bed. I'm just assuming they're like listening to a podcast in bed and they're just going to sleep. That sounds nice. Bravo! After my first listen, I rose to my feet to cheer your production and efforts. Greg, did you write this? <laughs> Greg's mom did. I would. Okay, I would never on. say bravo. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, I'm a book in hand kid. Kind of gal, but my plan is to try a new approach. Go through and hear each episode, and then at the conclusion, I shall sit down and read Tolkien's masterpiece, slowly savoring each beautiful word. By then, I won't be intimidated, and Hugh and I will have become intimate friends instead of mere acquaintances. I'm sharing this with all my Tolkien-loving friends. Really a genius idea. Thank you. Also, another review, five stars, said uh, that Dan's joke about Thingle was actually a bad joke. Like, it wasn't a good joke. <laughs> so, would love to hear what you guys think about that joke. It was supposed It'll to be, be a bad joke. It was funny because it was a bad joke. Oh, my gosh. People. So, leave us another review. Let us... What, Don't understand British humor. <laughs> um, yeah, keep the reviews coming. We'll love to read more in the future. Um, your feedback is making a difference. Uh, it's changing how we approach this. If you like what you hear, go ahead. Rate us three Silmarils out of three. Follow us everywhere at Before the Fellowship and send any comments or questions to beforethefellowship at gmail.com. Join us next week as we read The Greatest Story You've Never Heard, The Silmarillion by J.R.R. R. Tolkien. 